I'm going to be reading the probably most famous scripture reading ever, Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Verse 13, suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Verse 16, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what he had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen, heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Christmas time is actually for Easter, and Easter proves that Christmas is real. We, what's the big deal about Christmas, though? What is happens that almost the entire world stops and celebrates a day when Jesus was born. Why is a baby born 2,000 years ago, basically on the other side of the world, matter to us? The answer is Christmas is the most amazing news we're ever going to hear. It's the great news. It's the good news. The word gospel actually means good news. We're going to go back to the Christmas story this morning, Luke chapter 2. Like I said, it's probably the most known story in the whole Bible. There's postcards, greeting cards, little nativity scenes. But why? God never does anything without a reason. He has a plan for and a purpose for everything. Every rock has a purpose, every plant has a purpose, and every one of us has a purpose. God has a purpose for us being here this Advent time, this morning, for a reason. I want you just to kind of pray to yourself, what is that reason? What is the purpose of me being here now? Why did God send Jesus? For unto you is born a Savior. It's for your benefit, it's for my benefit, it's for our benefit. So we're going to see a couple things. We're going to see what happened, why did it happen, and how should we respond. And it's going to be a little bit different than I've done stuff in the past. It was a little more complicated, but I hope you can stick with me. What happened? Well, what happened was Jesus was born, and we looked at this last time. When she wrapped... Jesus, him, in swaddling cloths and placed him in a manger. Why? Because there was no room for him in the inn. So there's a baby wrapped in, I guess, a usual baby outfit. (laughs) But this time he's laid in a manger, a dirty feeding trough. But why? Well, listen to what happened. The power of God could make a decree happen that probably the most powerful man in the known world at that time decided to take a census for tax purposes and everybody had to go back to their hometown. So how did God make a decree happen that would affect the world. Well, it was this. It was to get 
Joseph and Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem on a certain day at a certain time to fulfill a prophecy in Micah that was written 700 years before. He could do that. They had to travel 80 miles over four days. It was dangerous. And she was, I don't know if you could be really pregnant, but you know what I mean. Like, but why? This was my question. Could God have arranged for Jesus, the firstborn son of God, to be born in the end instead of a manger? Absolutely. So why didn't he? If he orchestrated with his power all those other things, he made it very complicated. Well, he has a purpose. He has a plan. For his one and only son to be born and placed in a dirty feeding trough. Jesus starts his human life at the lowest, lowest point. And this is kind of amazing too. Instead of the king of kings being born in a palace or the lord of lords being born with the priestly families, here Jesus travels, gets there, and is born in a manger. And listen to what happens. There were shepherds. Now, this is kind of amazing because shepherds are kind of the lowest of the low. I don't know if you were here a couple years ago when I was talking about the shepherds. I was trying to figure out what they would be like in our culture today, and they would be kind of like a busboy. I don't know if you've ever been in the restaurant business, but kind of the job that everybody yells at this person, it all is the busboy. He always does everything wrong. It's like the shepherds are living out in the fields. It's the message doesn't come to a prophet. It doesn't come to a king. It doesn't even come to wise and upright people. It doesn't come to the Pharisees. The news comes to a shepherd who are living outside. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them. And guess what happens? And the glory of the Lord shone all around them. And they were terrified. They're not supposed to be afraid because the angel said, don't be afraid. But why not be afraid? Because obviously there's something to be afraid of. They've never seen something like this before. The angel said, don't be afraid. Why? Because there's good news and that good news will cause great joy because a savior has been born. But how will the shepherds know who it is when they get to Bethlehem. Who's the baby? It's Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. But what's the sign? The sign is you'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And my guess is even the shepherds are like, what? Well, you're telling us it's time for the Messiah, and he's just been born, and it's not in Jerusalem. It's in a stable and placed in a feeding trough. But the sign is, when you find a baby in a trough, it'll be the only baby in a trough, and that will be the Lord. So, the shepherds have been told. There's Christ the Messiah, the Lord, the promised one. And the angel of the Lord and the glory of the Lord shone all around them. So they hurried off. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word. So what we have is we have the glory of the Lord. We have the angel saying, fear not. Why? Because there's true joy coming. There's a Savior, the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. And the sign is a dirty feeding trough. He's born low in a stable where the animals eat. Why? It says for peace. The Savior, the Lord, 
is placed low. And when you find the baby out back in a barn, placed in a feeding trough, it's Christ the Lord. And the angels are telling the shepherds, fear not, don't be afraid. Just enjoy it. It starts off with the glory of the Lord and this section ends with the glory of the Lord. And what's amazing is, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So the angel told them exactly what to find, where to find it, they found it. And so, why did it happen? I'm going to give you a couple reasons why Jesus came. Jesus came to show us God. It's one of the purposes of Christmas. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. And think about the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. That is, the Word of God. The one that spoke the universe into existence. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And he was with God in the beginning. And through him... That is the Christ, the Lord. All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And then we get down to verse 14. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace, full of truth. At one point, the disciples were walking along, and Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why? Jesus came to show us God. Another reason is Jesus came to show us The word, his word, God's word. Jesus said, in fact, for this reason I was born. And for this reason I came into the world to testify true the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Everything is bound up in Jesus. Jesus said, when you know the truth, when you understand the truth, when you've met the truth, the truth will set you free. And that's exactly what he does for us. That's why, that's why we have Christmas. Jesus said, I've come into the world as light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. This is like the most amazing news. The word became flesh. And we actually get to see a person live the word. Jesus lives perfectly The word, the word that Jesus spoke to Moses. Give you another reason. Why did it happen? Jesus came to save sinful people. Jesus said, for the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. I did not come into the world to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus was giving his life as the ransom. I didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. What happened? God the Father sent God the Son. Why did it happen? We saw what happened. That's the Christmas story. We saw some reasons why it happened. 
But how? How can we apply the story to us now? How can we take the story that we all could probably tell? And we could probably tell it in the order it is in Luke. How should we respond? I think this is awesome. I think we should respond like Mary. We should make peace and we should fear not. Let me give you a couple things. What Luke is telling us is about how easy it is to hear and not hear. To hear the words of God, but to really not hear them. How do we hear the message of God? We hear the message from God in the word of God. And how do we respond? Now, Mary here is being held up as the model because she's going to do a couple things, and we've got to look at these lessons from Mary because they're easy to kind of miss. Don't miss Is this a word? Ordinariness. Is that a word? Ordinariness? No? Somebody look it up. If I just made up a word. Put it in. Don't miss the ordinariness of how the word of God comes to most of us. Most people. For all time. It comes to us in the form of the word of God. A very ordinary way. We didn't get it. In an ordinary way. It's actually. We got it in a. Amazing. Miracle way. But we can miss it. Notice what the shepherds got. What did the shepherds get? The shepherds get an angel. And you're like. You know what? If an angel told me. I'm in. That's what I need. I need an angel. Very few people got to get an angel to see him. What did everybody else in town get? The shepherds, right. They got the shepherds. The shepherds, the bus boys, they get the angel, the heavenly host. They go looking and they start spreading the word. And can you imagine all of a sudden a whole bunch of kids running around telling you what had just happened, the good news? Do we believe them? The shepherds get an angel. And the shepherds, the shepherds get an angel and everybody else gets a shepherd. When an angel appears, every time the brilliance, the glory, they just fall down. It's probably hard to do anything else. It's very easy for the shepherds to pay attention. Or no? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. It's... I mean, they're probably laying down. They've got all their goats, sheep herded up. I don't even know if that's right. (laughs) But they got them, you know, in. And they're laying out in the fields, and an angel shows up. And then a heavenly host shows up behind the announcement. My guess is they remembered every word the angel said. One guy that was teaching a, a class on how to remember people's names because he, he said, everybody says this. I'm, I'm bad with names. I don't get names. I see faces, but I don't get names. And he goes, what if I said to you right now, the next person you meet, find out their name, say their name to me, and then go say their name to them, and you get $100,000. Oh, now we're good with names. Because why? Because there's like a benefit for me to know your name if I'm going to... Can you imagine that here the angels are? It's probably easy to pay attention. But the shepherds get the angel. They're just bus boys, just ordinary people. They're the ones who, who come and give us the word, the word of God. What does this remind us of? It kind of reminds me of All the biblical authors over a 1,600 year period of time that it's written on three different continents, and it's all kind of different people. There's kings, there's shepherds, there's singers, there's disciples, there's all kind of people that are involved in writing the word. Think about Moses or Peter 
or Isaiah. These people actually had revelations. Some of them saw angels. Some of them heard God speak. It was easy for them to pay attention. They got the visions. They got the revelations. They got the spectacular. But what about the rest of us? We get a book to read. I mean, it's more than just a book, but we find out it's not just a book. But reading sometimes is not easy. It's really easy to read and not pay attention. Has anybody ever done that? Can you read and all of a sudden you look back? Show of hands, okay? And obviously you're like, I don't know what I just read. You know what's really awesome? If you really want to read, get a book, find the audio version of the book, play it at double speed while you're looking at it, you won't miss a thing. Well, maybe you will. I don't know how your brain works. Somebody said to me yesterday, I was playing something, and they were like, how can you even understand what they're saying? And I'm like, I don't know, that's how my brain's going. The faster they talk, you know, for a southern person, I really talk quickly. You you didn't know that? (laughs) So, it's really hard to pay attention. How many of us have made a decision to read through the Bible in a year starting in January? Okay, eight people, come on. Everybody's done it at one time, are you right? Okay, and you started off strong, and then you got to... Leviticus chapter 3. And you're like, what did I sign up for? I don't get this. The purity of, yeah. (laughs) Take the mold and wash it. (laughs) It's like, why? It's hard to pay attention when it's like that. It's really hard. One pastor called it resolutions that die the death of Leviticus. (laughs) And I was like, you know, that's hard. Um, Maybe we should try to preach through Leviticus one time. Yeah, it was like, really? (laughs) Because a lot of it doesn't make sense, so it would be a lot of study. But what if we ask the text questions? What if we pay attention to it? That's the point. Most of us for all time, have gotten the word of God in a very ordinary way. And it's very easily to either ignore it, to read it, but not really read it. But Mary has heard from an angel. But in verses 18 and 19, we're told, all who heard were amazed what the shepherd said to them. Now Mary, Mary's the model, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary didn't say, uh, I already had my angel, I don't have to listen to you guys. No, she's, she's taken what they're saying about the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, the Son of God. And she doesn't say, I already had an angel come directly to me. No, she's listening to what the shepherds are saying. And what does she do? She ponders and she treasures. Now, this is really cool because these two words are so jam-packed. The word ponder, put in this context, is actually to connect. It's actually how things fit together with everything else I know. So she's pondering, how does this make sense of the rest of my life? How does this connect to how I'm living now? So ponder means you're connecting, you're thinking it out. That's what, that's what Mary's doing with the shepherd's words, the words that came from God. What does it mean to everything else I know? What does it mean to the way I'm living now? So she's pondering. It's intense. It's actual mental discipline. You're, at, you're actually on purpose studying God's word and thinking, how does this apply to me? The word treasure has more to do with the emotions, kind of the heart. Treasure literally means to keep something alive. Mary It's keeping something alive. It's feeding the fire. Or keeping a little kitten 
alive by nurturing it. It's a word that actually means to relish or to savor, to keep this thing going. Like think about savoring something. That's what Mary's doing. We're told she doesn't just ponder the word of God and the message of God. She fans the flame in her heart. Are we doing that? It's not a technique. It's an attitude that she has towards the word. Don't underestimate your ability to hear and to not hear the word of God. Because remember the parable of the sower. The seeds fall and most of the time they don't really grow. That's most of our hearts because there's either no soil, the sun burns it away, or it gets choked out by weeds. The fact that most people's hearts hear but don't really hear. And people will say, I just don't believe. But a lot of people would say, I believe. Yet they don't treasure it. They don't ponder. It doesn't come in. It doesn't change their life. Do you want to be like the crowd that marvels at what the shepherds are saying? Or to be like Mary? Put another way, I'm glad you're here. You should hear the word of God preached and taught. And I think it's the job of the people that do that to try to be interesting and persuasive, to make you want to hear, make you want to come and hear. But can you hold your own attention? Can you interest yourself? Can you sit down and treasure and fan the flame of God's word, keeping it alive in your emotions? That's what Luke's saying. He's saying, ponder and treasure like Mary. That's what Luke is telling us. And the next thing we need to do, we need to ponder like Mary, but we need to make peace. The Christians, we're saved by grace. We should be the most loving, forgiving, gracious people ever. And a lot of the times, we're the most condemning, arrogant people ever. Which if you're saved by grace, you should be thinking, what does Jesus say at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount? People that live in my kingdom are peacemakers. That's us. We're supposed to be peacemakers. Grace and peace, they go together. In verse 10 it says, the good news, the good news for everyone. Christians should be fanning the flames, being peacemakers. We should be pondering, we should be thinking we know how to admit when we're wrong. We ask for forgiveness. We know that we're reconciled to God. We should be putting ourselves in every part of society and we should be the biggest forgivers. Forgivers. We should be the fastest repenters. Christmas means that on the basis of the grace of God, peace with God is available. And if we take the peace, then we can go out and make peace. The world, your family, the community, this state, this country, the entire world should be better because we're in it. It should be. We are quick forgivers. We're quick repenters. We, we want to make the peace. Is the world better off because you're here? So respond like Mary, make peace, and then listen, and fear not. This, I love this old translation. Listen to this. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were sore afraid. Who writes like that? Sore afraid. It actually means they're terrified. It's actually, there's, there's two words. It's actually Megaphobic. That's actually the word. Mega, which is the Greek for magnify, and phobia, which is for fear. So they were mega afraid, mega fearful. So in Old English, they were sore afraid. And the, and the angel doesn't ignore that. The angel stops and goes, No, 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 don't be afraid. 
This is nothing to be afraid of. This is, I'm coming and giving you the best news. And the shepherds have to be thinking, why do I get the news? They get it. But they get the news. I know. The angel comes and says, don't be afraid. I kind of like is the angel says, I know you live a life of terror, but you don't have to be afraid anymore. If you look at what I'm showing you, if you go and see what I've done for you, if you go and see who I've sent. Why are we trying to be our own masters? Because I think we know when we are in control of stuff, we mess stuff up. And that's what makes us afraid. If we're trying to be our own master, I know I'm in control, but I know me. And we have lots of fears. Fear of failure. Fear of the future. Fear of death. But when God comes near us, we're terrified. Because like the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus just falls down. We're filled with fear because we know how ugly we are inside and how much we need this grace. And the angel says, I've got a solution. Fear not, for behold, which means to the degree, to the degree, fears wander mine. But a Savior is born who is the Christ. Christmas starts and it's for Easter. And Easter proves that Christmas is real. Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, started life off as low as it could be. His first day of existence as a human is actually placed where goats eat. And it's what God uses as a sign. And the sign is the first step towards the cross, why he's born. The reason Jesus was born was to go to the cross. He committed no crime, but he died a criminal's death. They crucified him. The Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, why? To absorb God's wrath for our sin. In Romans 5 it says, For if we, while we were God's enemies... We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, lived and died in our place. Why? To take away our condemnation. Why? To reconcile us to God. Why? To show us his love. Jesus paid the ultimate, the highest price, to give us the greatest gift and what is that gift? Eternal life. He's showing us his grace. And after the death on the cross, they place Jesus in a tomb. But three days later, he arose proving that his birth was real. And he lives today. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. Christmas is for Easter. And Easter proves that Christmas is real. Do you believe? Let's pray. Oh, Lord, help us to take your word like Mary did, to ponder it, to treasure it, to keep the flame going, to let it be in us and go through us and help us to live out the things that it tells us. Father, if there's someone here that realizes, no, that, that's not me, I've been coming to church for a long time, but I'm not fanning any flame. But I want to. Lord, forgive me. You can pray that right now. Lord, forgive me. I, I want what you want for me. I want a treasure. I want to ponder. And Father, if there's someone here that they're just realizing that this amazing good news, that peace and they realize they need that peace. I need that. I want that peace that Jesus gives. That they could 
right now confess in their heart that Jesus is Lord. And you welcome them in as your children. Oh, Father, this Christmas, let us treasure, let us ponder. Amen.